Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 387th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for joining me today. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Acceptance Mount School Admissions Calculator can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash 387 quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accepted.com slash 387 quiz to obtain your free assessment. Today's guest, Joel DeBow, Director of Admissions and Records for Dell Medical School at UT Austin, earned his MBA at the University of North Texas and worked at UNT's Health Science Center as Assistant Dean of Admissions from 2004 to 2015, when he joined the brand new medical school at UT Austin, the Dell Medical School, which we're going to learn about right now. Joel, welcome to Admissions Straight Talk. Thank you. I'm delighted to speak with you today. Can you, first to start, give an overview of the Dell Medical MD program? Well, I think I would probably uh, point to our curriculum and describe that first because that's the, one of the most unique aspects of Dell Medical School. And, and as a brand new medical school, one of the things that we had an opportunity to do was to rethink medical education. What were the, um, what were the, the challenges that physicians face today that may not necessarily be addressed with a traditional medical education? And in particular, how to reinvent healthcare uh, and what skills do clinicians need today to, to not only take care of their patients, but also manage the healthcare system. And so we looked at, uh, and I say we, uh, uh, euphemistically, the, 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 the greater minds in medical education looked at curriculums from across the country and, and across the uh, other countries as well to see what skills do physicians need to develop and how can we design a curriculum to, to meet that? So the first thing that many students recognize is that our basic science curriculum is only 12 months long. And so historically in a Flexner-like uh, model, that would be a, a two year uh, right. length of, of basic science education. That allows us uh, to then use the second year for clinical education. Historically, that would be your third year. Having our students uh, go through that training in that sequence that opens up the third year to really a, a lot of marvelous opportunities, especially since we're part of the University of Texas and there are so many great um, training programs at the university that can be beneficial for future leaders. And so making that third year available for a dual degree or research uh, activity uh, really gives our students an opportunity to expand their skills in that third year uh, that you historically would not necessarily get in medical training, and particularly if you're interested in going on to, to manage uh, or work in management in a hospital setting, you may choose to do the MBA program, for instance. We have uh, a brand new uh, health policy degree opening up with the LBJ school for that year. We have a, uh, a health transformation degree uh, that's just brand new in our, in our, uh, in our school for that year that's actually uh, created by Elizabeth Tysberg, who was one of the co-authors of the book about healthcare transformation. Uh, that's really uh, kind of changed how we think about managing healthcare. So that third year uh, really expands the opportunity for our students to gain additional skills that one would not necessarily get in medical training. But we believe it's necessary if you're going to, to be at the table making decisions about how healthcare is gonna change. Uh, and as we start to think also about not just the, the process of, uh, uh, of, of using uh, fee payer models to run healthcare, but think more about how healthcare outcomes are more important drivers than procedural based or, or frequency of activity. And then the fourth year is much more traditional. That is when our students begin to navigate the residency selection or search process 
and they may do away rotations along with additional clinical training as they continue to grow as clinicians and prepare for their first year as interns. We do have them go through uh, two acting internships during that year. Uh, this is uh, a level of clinical training that is a much higher expectation than a traditional uh, level of training would uh, a trainee would experience as a student. The expectation are, is, go ahead. What are some of the differences? Well, the expectation is the, uh, the level of um, clinical management uh, that the person should be at should be at the same level that a first year intern would be. Oh, okay. And so the expectation is when they actually end up on uh, their residency, they are not surprised or shocked by the responsibility that they have, that they should have developed some of those skills already. Uh, and, and have the, uh, the, the basic five uh, skill sets that, that residencies expect them to have when they come in. But that's, I think, what makes us the most unique is, is the, um, if, if one can be most unique, I just heard my mother's voice in my head who said this, either unique or you're not unique. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but uh, I think that, that distinction, that 12 month curriculum uh, undergraduate or uh, undergraduate medical curriculum of 12 months of basic science is is pretty unique again using a, a qualifier um, but I think also of note of, of that curriculum is also interesting is that one would think that if you reduce the amount of time that you would increase the amount of class time in that yeah. year and in truth we actually have fewer contact hours in lecture because we do most of our training in small group learning models. And so the expectation is that when you're in lecture, that is the application of knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge is actually going to occur outside of the, of the lecture classroom and it's gonna be in your small group uh, learning module where you will acquire that information. And so lecture is much more about, uh, you should have learned this information, how well did you understand it? How does it interrelate? How does it interdigitate with the information that you should already have? as it relates to this clinical problem. So it sounds more like a, a flipped classroom kind of model. It is exactly what it is, a flipped classroom. Now, it also appears that Dell Medical compresses the didactic portion of what was traditionally a two-year portion of medical school into one year. Um, how have your graduates done? I realize you're a fairly new school, but you do already have mm -hmm. graduating classes. How have they done with residency placement and on the USMLE exams? Uh, so that was one of the big questions when we started was, can, can you uh, adequately prepare uh, your trainee for, you know, everybody thinks about the USMLE, but really the, the point is, do you have the basic science foundational knowledge that go into clinical management, which is in, in the uh, clerkships? So the initial indications when they went from their first year to second year was that uh, many of our uh, clinical sites, which were already teaching medical students at the, their site, so they had experience, felt like our students were uh, not only prepared, but seemed to be better prepared for that experience. Wow. We also, um, everybody kind of held their breath, what's gonna happen with, uh, with step one? And, and you know, our, our dean famously said, he really doesn't care that much about step one. In fact, he was an advocate and, and um, his, uh, he advocated for, for the exam to become pass-fail, which it has now become pass-fail. But we had to step back a little bit and, and really um, enjoy the fact that our students did so exceptionally well on that exam, almost a standard deviation above the national average uh, wow. on their average. That's awesome. um, so they, they did ex extremely well um, and they worked, uh, uh, you know, everybody would like to take credit for that, but really the credit goes to them. They worked very hard. Um, so, as far as being able to, to capture the, the competencies they needed in order to do well in that exam, they did with that 12 month uh, a lot of time. Um, but more importantly, what happens in uh, the second year is they start to see the clinical manifestations of that basic science uh, or what the constructs they should be learning from the basic science. And so when they see the, the disease process, and then they go back and take step one, what's happening is that they're saying, ah, well, I know what this is. And so instead of trying to narrow down five choices, they're now narrowing down two choices because they're able to quickly identify what the disease process is. And that's part of the, the exam. It's a second order, third order question exam where you first have to know what, the, what they're describing as a disease process before you can talk about the, 
the basic science or biochemical uh, activity that's occurring. So that, that seemed to have worked very well as far as uh, their training. Yeah, and, and they're getting, they got their residencies in terms of... Absolutely, everybody got the, the residency of their choice and uh, some exceptional programs that they've gone to. Uh, we always want them to stay closer to home, but they tend to, to cast a wider net. Uh, but we have a number of, of our students who have stayed in Austin, which is really important for our community, that they continue their training here. But we have students who are, have gone from coast to coast in their training as well. Wow, okay. Now, let's get back to that unique or distinctive part of the, the program. That's the, mm -hmm. the third year. I had the pleasure of interviewing a couple of weeks ago, Zach Timmons from The Good Apple. Yes. And listeners can find that at exhibit.com slash 379. And he for his third year project, he founded the Good Apple, which is a, a project to, um, I guess, give healthy food, healthy pro produce and local produce, both to, to all residents of, of Austin, both those who pay and those who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a fascinating uh, project, a fascinating lecture. What are some of the other things that students have done in their third year? Uh, so it, it can run the gamut. Of course, it, it's the dual degree is one option, but then if you want to do the, uh, the research or the... Do most uh, people go for the dual degree or do they do things uh, like other things? Uh, like it is a, it's almost half and half. Okay. Um, a little bit more on the dual degree side this last year. Um, and that's because there, there are many more dual degree options as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't help one of their, their peers in their project and do that, but they're not going to do a full-time project like uh, some of their peers will. But uh, an example that comes to mind in our first year, uh, one of our students who was uh, an Austin native and very interested in uh, her community and in particular her geriatric community, um, began to, to develop a um, program within the assisted, uh, the subsidized housing program to connect elderly with resources. They, these, these are individuals who live in subsidized housing but don't necessarily have any connection with resources. Um, and discovered that there was a lot of commonality in their needs and they, and they actually, uh, if connected to each other, actually developed a stronger support group. And she worked with the Housing Authority of Austin to, to develop that program. And that program I believe is still ongoing as a result of her work. Wow. That's one, and that's one of the key things like Zach's program as well um, the, the, one of the, the drivers or one of the, the uh, asks of them is to develop something that's sustainable over time. Uh, because you can, you can go out and get a grant and you can go intervene or do some kind of intervention in the community. But when the grant ceases to exist, then that intervention ceases to exist. And so how do you develop sustainable activities that directly affect the health of our community? And so that's, that's uh, those types of examples that they're working on. Fascinating. Yeah. Now, let's turn to admissions at Dell Medical. I think you've, you've put out enough information. People are probably thinking, gee, how can I get in now? So oh, uh, <laughs> um, does Dell Medical screen secondaries? Are non-Texas residents admitted to Dell Medical? Well, we have a statute uh, in Texas that no medical school can admit more than 10% of their class as non-Texas residents. And so uh, in Texas, we're, we're very fortunate that the state still subsidizes medical education to a high degree. And the expectation is, and the recognition from state leadership is that we, we have a shortage of physicians and Texas has grown much faster than we ever expected it to grow. So we do need to grow more healthcare providers as well. So we're fortunate in that regard that, that it's still uh, relatively well subsidized. It's still, you know, it's, it, medical education is a, a cost burden, but it's not, uh, what one would think um, when looking at other private or other states. So it's, it's still a good deal. And part of that expectation is that we train Texans to become those physicians. And so that's why we have a 10% cap on, on out of state. Now for a small class like ours, we only have 50 students, that's five students. So it's, right. it's not it's a big small. population. Right. Um, we do, uh, what we do for, for screening in the first part of our process is we actually screen applicants to, uh, to invite, to commit, or to invite to uh, submit a secondary. So we really didn't think it was fair to open up the secondary application to everybody and then 
really not review every single secondary that came in. So we wanted to be sure that we we're giving those students who we felt like had past behavior that aligned with our mission an opportunity to, to answer the secondary. And some choose to and some, and some choose not to. So the first part of our screening is really looking at a balance of cognitive and non-cognitive attributes that we think are relevant to uh, being successful as a Dell medical student. Um, on the cognitive side, I think students are all very familiar with the measures that, that people use, but we really don't just use an average or um, a, just a block number. We look at trends, we look at academic uh, activity. If you started out like I did as a freshman in college and when they told you class was optional, you believed it was optional or attendance was optional, I should say, um, and then got more serious as I matured, you can see that upward trend. Uh, we also look at students who have had other careers and have come back and done post-baccalaureate work in order to, to develop the foundational knowledge necessary to, to be successful in our curriculum. And that's really the test. Have they demonstrated um, development in those competencies so that when they do come into our accelerated curriculum, they are going to have the foundational knowledge to be successful? Because okay. it, it does require that you have a certain set of, of competencies developed already or else you're really going to be behind and it's not something that you can catch up on. Um, and we, we look at um, other indicators of that kind of competency development, which includes uh, not just taking the minimum prerequisites, but what other advanced courses one might have taken. We also look at what other um, uh, obligations one might have uh, to be successful in a in, or, or that they've taken away from their academic uh, uh, opportunities. Maybe they had to work or care for siblings or children or, or or a student athlete or were in the military, things of that nature to see how um, they've developed those competencies over time. And so that, that's the cognitive look. And then we do a non-cognitive look at attributes that we think are relevant or past behavior that we think are relevant to our mission. So we're particularly interested in seeing individuals who've demonstrated in their past behavior evidence of leadership and teamwork, innovation and creativity, and engagement in their community, which all these things align with what we're trying to do as, as, uh, as our mission, making Austin a model healthy city. And so we look for a combination of those and uh, try to find a balance before we invite somebody to, to submit a secondary. Uh, some students um, will ask, and I have a 4.0 and a 98% and a, and a, and a MCAT, but I did not receive a secondary. And it's really, because you have to have really a foot in both houses. You have to really have, have a combination of, of both the competencies in the basic sciences, but also these past behaviors that really align with what we're trying to accomplish. So you obviously review the MCAS application or, or the TMDSAS application, I should say, uh, the primary application before you send out secondaries. Yeah, we have, there's, there are multiple steps. There's multiple steps of review that occur. Um, mm -hmm. this, this particular review is much wider casting of the net. It's, it's looking at past behavior. Sure. And it's, it's much broader. So we invite about 600 people to 800 people to submit a secondary application. If they submit the secondary, then that then comes down to a much uh, more stringent review solely on uh, the non-cognitive competencies or non-cognitive attributes. And that, that file is then independently reviewed by two reviewers who have no academic uh, information about the candidate, only their, their um, past behavior or VITA activity. Mm -hmm. And they use that to make a decision about how well this person aligns with our mission. Very interesting. Okay. So, because typically, I mean, a lot of schools screen strictly based on, on MCAT or GPA and MCAT or some, some combination of them. But, um, and I think overall schools have been moving away from any kind of more uh, deeper human, human involvement in the, in the pre-secondary screening. But that's great. Well, we have, you know, we're, we're very fortunate um, that, that there's a number of students who are seeking this career called medicine. Oh, yeah. and, and so uh, we have an opportunity to, to really look at students for a couple of things. One is the capacity to handle the curriculum, which is a really important foundational set of experiences or skill development that has to be there. But then you also have the opportunity to see who best fits or aligns with what you're trying to accomplish as a new school. And uh, we believe we have a fairly unique mission and we are attempting to, to find those students who based on their past behavior are going to continue to exemplify or, or 
or actually quite literally, um, exceed our expectations and what they can come up with. Um, you know, Zach's an example of that. Yeah. Um, I can also relate in our inaugural class, uh, we, had, uh, we had three students, all three had previously been science teachers before they came to medical school, uh, high school science teachers. And so they're in, a, they're in an inaugural class, inaugural class of, of first years in an accelerated basic science curriculum. And the only expectation we had for them was to be successful in that curriculum. But they missed teaching so much, and the three of them connected based on their teaching experience, they decided on their own to develop a STEM outreach program with a local high school which had no science uh, instruction at all in their curriculum wow. or STEM curriculum. And they created this, this outreach with this local high school, which is still lives today. They've graduated, and that program still lives today with our students. And I think that's a good example of, of how past behavior can predict future behavior. Uh, so there we, so we saw evidence in, in their experiences, their interest in engaging and in, in connecting with, in their particular case, connecting with young people and teaching, and teaching science. Um, so that then propagated itself into an idea that they started on their own. Yeah, that's fascinating. And of course, Zach had been a consultant before yeah. he came to medical school. Mm -hmm. So he had this kind of, I guess, strategic uh, organizational ability, business ability. That, that and, and, and to think about a problem about how, from his perspective, is, you know, the, the solution is obvious, give everybody healthy food. But how do you fund it? How do you fund it? And how do you build something that's sustaining? And he figured out a way to make it um, self-funding by virtue of those who can pay and those who can't really recognizing the partnership they could develop. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that uh, is proving, and it's, I, I wish I could say it wasn't serendipitous, but with the current uh, climate or conditions that we're in right now, many more people in our community uh, became food insecure overnight. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they really have stepped up uh, their activity to, to do more than I think they even expected this year to do. Wow, that's fantastic. No, it, was a, it was a great interview. Again, that's exhibit.com slash 379 for anybody interested in more information. What are Dell Medical's plans in terms of interviewing for this year? So we have started our virtual interview day experience. Um, we have a, a fair, we have a, a, a rigorous interview day. It's unlike most um, interview experiences and it's, it's purposeful and it's designed. But we do, on premise, we do a traditional 30 minute interview with a faculty member five multi-mini interview interviews, and then we have a group exercise interview wow. that we also conduct. <laughs> That's so, pretty thorough. <laughs> yeah, so it's, and, and there really are, there are about 60 different points of evaluation that occur across, that, across the day, and it, it, it gives us an opportunity really to map back to all of our attributes that we think are relevant in our mission. Right. It, also, it also gives a student, an applicant, multiple times to really um, talk about how their experiences might align with what we're trying to do. So it's not just one interview and it's that person's perception, it's multiple perceptions or experiences that they've exposed to across the day. And obviously that's entirely virtual. Well, so that was the challenge is how do we then turn that, uh, you know, we, the, the, many of the comments from my colleagues across the country when they were starting to do virtuals, keep it as simple as possible. And I thought, well, that's the one thing our interview day is not as, as simple. <laughs> um, so we have, uh, we, uh, are utilizing um, Zoom for the, the um, traditional interview, the, the welcome presentation, and the um, group exercise. Uh, but we've also leveraged a technology called VidCruder to create uh, an analog to the MMI, which we ca we're now calling the multi-video assessment, which is an asynchronous video um, MMI uh, activity. And it, that has worked really well. Um, really? And so we, we have as, as close to the, the on-premise experience as we can, I think we've, we've created an MMI experience that's virtual. So uh, how many uh, speed dates do they, do they have with the MMI? How many stations do they have? They, they have five, five stations and uh, the timing is, is very similar to the timing that one would have when they're going from office to office. The only difference is that they uh, don't have an interviewer in the room with them. The interviewer will review their evaluate or their uh, interview after. So it's asynchronous. Uh, 
Right. Um, we do have a workflow model inside of it. So as they uh, go through that exercise, they will be prompted which direction they're going, they'll get additional follow-up information. So um, the feedback from the, now the same technology is what we've been using for our secondary for a couple of years. So we've had a video secondary for a couple of years now. And our uh, research shows that the, there is a significant correlation between our evaluation of their communication ability in the video secondary as the on-premise MMI communication ability. So we've always known that there's a correlation there what, what we don't know yet is how well um, we can discern the things that we're looking for in the MMI in that asynchronous video format. Um, the feedback from our interviewers so far has been that they have actually liked this um, because they felt like they could be more objective uh, in their evaluation than necessarily being there in the room. So we'll continue to, to uh, monitor and, and then evaluate against previous years to see how well this, this exercise works. Fascinating. And in terms of your secondary, just going back to that, is it exclusively the video or is there a written part and a video? And I'm guessing that you're not using the AMC's Vita. Uh, no, we're, we're using that same VidCruder technology that we started using about two and a half, almost three years ago. Um, okay. And we, when we instituted it, we offered the option for students to choose the written or the video secondary with the expectation that maybe 20% would want to do the written exercise and the rest would be okay with the video. But we've actually had less than 1% actually choose the written really? uh, uh, secondary. And yeah. the, feedback, the <laughs> feedback we get from them is that they truly feel like it's another opportunity for them in a different way to tell their story and their voice. And it's not, uh, for us, it's, it's important that we have some other mechanism to get a spontaneous response as opposed to, you know, an edited and edited and re-edited response, which many of the secondaries, written secondaries truly, some give some new insight, but many give repeated insight that's on the application. So we wanted another mechanism so that we could learn more about the student in their own words. And uh, we found that it does give us that opportunity. And do students know ahead of time what they're going to be answering? Or is that, you know, you have a bank of questions and it's whatever they get? Uh, they have a bank of questions, and but the question, the bank is in three primary domains of activity. Mm -hmm. And then they, the question may be, it's reflecting in that domain about past behavior. So they're not asked to come up with anything uh, where they would have had to study for or uh, have to um, uh, 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 quantify something uh, the, or an example, they um, uh, What are the are, three domains, may I ask? Uh, it's, uh, they're the same as the, um, the pillars that we talked about earlier, innovation, creativity, teamwork, okay. leadership, and community engagement. And, and, so, and it's so all it's basically about, basically about their experience in those domains. Exactly. Got it. And in their own words. Right. It's probably also very much generational. You know that they're used to being on video, much more used to being on video, and writing is is, is more of a chore. Uh, I don't, you don't I think don't, so. I don't know. I have I have not seen. Now we have uh, we do have a wide range of applicants as far as age, but the majority of applicants are going to be at the traditional age. Um, I have not seen a trend where our older students wanted to do the. Um, uh, the written. In fact, in some cases, especially if they've been professionals before, uh, they're, they're very effective in the video secondary. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I guess I, I, I would almost always just choose to write something, <laughs> but um, it may just be a personal preference and have nothing to do with generations. Uh, are there any plans or do, to extend the deadline for the secondary since this whole cycle has kind of been pushed later? by COVID. Yeah, so the uh, team DCS has uh, extended the deadline by a month on all oh, okay. of our dates. So we've pushed everything back a month. So we will be interviewing uh, in February as well, which is not traditional for Texas. Texas usually finishes interviewing in January. All right. And um, how do you view letters of intent, uh, either from, from applicants who've interviewed and haven't heard if they're accepted or from applicants who haven't heard if they're going to be interviewed. Uh, are they encouraged, discouraged, ignored? What's, what's Dell's policy? 
Well, we, we will not um, forward them to the committee. Okay. So um, now we will, you know, if you want to submit one, we will put it in your file, but it will not be provided as additional content uh, for your application. We, we think it's very important that the uh, communication channel that's through the application is the only uh, method for delivering content to the committee. So basically uh, it's useless. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, well, useless, I mean, it's nice to see and nice to hear, um, but it doesn't affect any part of the decision. Okay. Uh, and that's to be sure that it's fair for everyone. Um, if, if you were allowed to submit additional letters of support outside of the application, then uh, our committee would have to read, what, 10 or 15 letters per candidate, first of all. And so our question would be, could you not have found three people that could have done this just as well? I think it also minimizes the, the effect of each of those letters as well. If you haven't really chosen well who you, you want to write your recommendation letter. Um, but also the, the idea that it's consistent throughout the process is consistent and there aren't mechanisms for some people to get more information in and other people don't know about. And so um, it's really, a, a, it's to ensure that our committee is looking at the same information for every candidate throughout the entire process. Okay, got it. Now, we just talked about, or you mentioned that uh, Dell Medical is extending its secondary deadline, which probably will also push back at least a little bit when it's releasing um, uh, decisions. But COVID has really affected every corner of our lives, including medical school admissions. How is uh, Dell Medical um, dealing with the fact, well, I guess you're, you're, the answer, you're extending the deadline in terms of everything being late. This is one of the most common questions I'm getting now. Mm -hmm. I just took my MCAT, can I still apply? Mm -hmm. Or should I wait till next year? Um, I couldn't take my MCAT earlier because of the because of right. COVID. Or I was um, going to do this in this volunteer initiative or this in this research initiative, it was canceled. Um, I had to take classes online where you know, I really wanted to take it offline. I had to do something pass fail, I really want to take it for a grade. So how do you respond to those concerns in, in pre-med? So for this particular class that's coming through right now, yeah. uh, the COVID really hit towards the end of uh, that window, which they'd be reporting in their application. So you, they have a whole arc of activity going back several years. So it's not a single snapshot that's being evaluated. We're looking at the entirety of their, of their academic record and their experiences. Um, but we also recognize when we review that they, uh, they have interruptions that have occurred as a result of that. And so we're always curious to see how that impacted them. What did they do when, when faced with that? Um, you know, looking at evidence of resiliency and creativity um, and, or, you know, and, and recognizing that maybe they took on new responsibility as well. And so uh, that's what we're trying to, to to look at with an eye to recognizing that it's impacted everybody's life. Um, as far as the the deadline, we talked about that's extended out. And yes, if you if you have uh, taken the MCAT later, we're going to be looking at those applications as well. You also mentioned about making offers. We are going to start making offers to students the same time we would have in previous years. Okay. However, we are very deliberate in how we make offers, so we always want to look at everybody we've interviewed. So we don't make a whole lot of offers starting out the gate. So we'll make a few offers as we move along. And we also, in Texas, we have something called the match for, for, um, for uh, undergraduate medical education. So we also make offers to the match and we also make offers off the wait list. So um, I would not want a student to think that if they're being interviewed in January that they have no opportunity to be made an offer or else why did we ask them to interview in January, for example. Sure. And so, um, so we're, we're pretty deliberate in that. We don't fill up early. Uh, we recognize what our, our trend line is and we make a few offers at a time. Um, the class that I'm worried about most actually is not this year's class, but next year's class. Uh, they are probably um, having to figure out how to adjust to this new norm in a, in a way that is gonna impact their application more severely, I think, than this current uh, application cycle. Because this is the point in time when many of those students would have uh, been engaged in maybe second year of research, right. um, uh, engaged in, in leadership activities that would have been part of their organizations that they were involved in. 
and then we've been advancing into those leadership activities this year. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see how have they adjusted. What have they done to be creative? What have they done to, to uh, adjust to the new norm? Right, right. Are you, I mean, you seem to be very, um, and Del Medical obviously seems to be very focused on its, its priorities and its values. Have, do you see yourself looking for slightly different or additional attributes in applicants because of COVID? No, I think that the same, the same skills that we're looking for um, are, uh, are not, uh, I don't think COVID is, is a, is, the effect of COVID is not necessarily what we're looking at. We're looking at what did you do as a result of this, this, um, this occurring. Right. Um, much like we would look at you know, if you had an obstacle that you overcame, how did you overcome it? So the, 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 the skills Everybody that we, has this obstacle. Yeah, so this one's a little bit different. Everybody has this one. But um, what are you doing in light of that? Uh, are, how are you being creative? Uh, what are you doing to engage? Um, but also recognizing that, that it's going to limit. For instance, I, I suspect many students are not going to have the opportunity to shadow as a result of it. So... Um, we will recognize that that's occurring. But what other things have they done uh, to, to take that time that they have to try to engage in their community? Did they do uh, you know, contact tracing, which you can do remotely? Did they volunteer at a, uh, in a location where it was safe to volunteer, for example? Um, or did they start something online? Uh, I think that it's so it's to look at what they've done creatively, but also with an eye to the fact that it's limited a lot of their ability to do so. Right, for sure. Now, looking forward, um, what advice would you give pre-meds thinking ahead and planning to apply next summer for a 2022 matriculation? Mostly we've talked about people hoping to matriculate in 2021. What would you advise, not this year's applicants, but next year's applicants? Well, um, some of them are going back to school. Some of them are not right now. Some of them are um, uh, staying at home completely. Uh, some, are, some are doing uh, hybrid models. Right. Um, I do know that at the University of Texas that they're looking at ways to open up some of the labs for people to still get engaged and involved. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, would, I would look to what what's happening, where, what conditions are you in, and what can you do to uh, stay engaged in some way that you can't tr do now, it would be traditionally the way you would get engaged, um, and look for those kinds of opportunities. Uh, obviously, uh, being successful in an online curriculum is more challenging, and so you, you want to focus on that, and that's, that shows resilience. Um, but then what are the other opportunities? Does your organization still meet? Do they still have uh, leadership activities that you're engaged in? Uh, are there things that they're adjusting to that you're a part of? Um, so you, you, I think you really need to start thinking about what can you do uh, to still be thinking about your interest in healthcare and how it's currently being impacted by this once in a century pandemic. Right. Uh, so we're looking to see what, what, what they're engaging in and how they're engaging. Yeah. And again, doing it within the mindset of, of what they can do and what they can't do as far as safety is concerned. There's certainly lots of opportunities that I, th I think, you know, as, as so often happens, um, some doors have closed and some doors have opened wide. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are lots of opportunities. Um, contract tracing you mentioned. I think there are also, you know, various helplines, you know, suicide helplines, uh, domestic abuse helplines. Uh, there's helping the vulnerable who are not supposed to go to the stores. This kind of stuff, or helping the elderly that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier in the call. So there's, there are definitely opportunities. What would you have liked me to ask you? What would you like somebody to know about Dell Medical that we haven't covered? 
especially for and from an admissions perspective. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that um, one of the things that that pre meds tend to, to fixate on is what are the minimum requirements? What what do I need to do to get in? And I sometimes want to flip that on its head and say, well, what, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and what, think about why do we ask a few of these to do these things like uh, prerequisites, for instance. And the whole, the, the prerequisites for medical school are the minimum foundational constructs or knowledge that you need to have for being successful on the MCAT, which is a, to verify that you retain those constructs, but also where they're going to start training in your basic science curriculum. And so I, I would encourage students to not think about just what's the minimum, but what can I do to prepare myself for this education? What kind of courses can I take that will help prepare me for uh, this type of, 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 of education I'm about to go into? And that includes uh, you know, looking at more advanced courses like physiology, um, genetics, not just taking biochem and that's stopping right there. Um, so I, 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 you know, the challenge is to think about not what's, what, what should I do because you're asking it of me, but why are you asking of me to do this? And what can I do to better prepare myself? Because it's not about just making one hurdle and the next hurdle. It's about building a, a foundation of experiences and knowledge that's going to help then take you to the next level. Okay. Um, so so I, that's what I worry about sometimes is we think too much about well, what's the minimum and what's the required GPA. Yeah, so what's the required GPA and what's the minimum requirement? Um, it's really about the, the, the totality of that experience and the knowledge that you, that you develop as a result of that experience. I sometimes get the question, um, you know, what's the minimum MCAT score I need? My GPA is X. And, you know, it's like, just, just go for the best MCAT you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, and and it's then a, deal with it. Right. And, it, and it's, it's the question is, it's a GPA of X in what courses? Right. And sure. in what trends? And what I trend? Mean, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So anyways, Joel, thank you so much. Uh, this has been fascinating and, and illuminating. I think we're almost out of time. I want to thank you very much for joining me and sharing your expertise and insight into Dell Medical. Where can listeners learn more about Dell Medical School at UT Austin? Well, if they want to go to our website at dellmed.utexas.edu and click on how to apply, and that will tell you more information about the unique aspects of the Texas admissions uh, process and our application process, our criteria. Thank you very much, Joel. We're going to include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 387 to Dell Medical's website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. Quick reminder, don't miss Accepted's free assessment tool, the Med School Admissions Quiz. Find out if you are really ready and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash 387 quiz and do it today. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.